Hi, Tom Stewart here with Clean Business Today. I've got my uh, partner, Liz Trotter. Hey, Liz. Hi. And we're really lucky to uh, have my good friend, Matt Ricketts uh, from Better Life Maids out in St. Louis, Missouri. How are you doing, Matt? Hey, good, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Dude, you're not. So, so appreciate that you come on and do this with us, Matt. I know you even missed an appointment today to do this with us. So really, thank you so much. That or just my brain is fried, one of the two. Yeah, I think you missed your appointment <laughs> regardless, but nevertheless, we do realize that uh, this is a commitment. And uh, it was we, a call, I was on a call with Tom at that time when I was supposed to be doing that other meeting. That <laughs> yeah. Shocker. Tom made you miss an appointment. <laughs> uh, it was my Man, that's an awesome uh, scene you got there. Are you in your house? Uh, yeah, this is uh, kind of – it's – part of our master bedroom suite so it's got like a little loft with the fireplace and uh like loft and ceilings and uh yeah it's like a our house is like a 1950s house so like the fireplace is all kind of like what, what is that mid-century so it's all uh, uh I, know you're, I know you're a pilot matt so that prop on the uh, mantle is that off of one of the planes you used to fly it's actually off a plane my dad rebuilt with his dad it's off of a um uh it's kind of like a Piper Cub would be the closest thing I could describe where people would even know what I'm talking about. It's called a Vagabond. Okay. It, was, it was built in like post-World War II for basically anybody could kind of buy this thing. It was relatively inexpensive, fat, you know, fabric wings. And uh, so him and his dad bought one in the 60s and uh, with some buddies and they rebuilt it. That was the original prop off it. And then my grandfather took it off and messed with it, put a clock in it at one point. But, you know, <laughs> um, it, you know, kind of hollowed it out a little bit, but so that's, that was uh, a real wooden prop off of uh, a plane that still flies. My dad still owns that plane um, to this day. It's one of my favorite planes to fly. It's, it only goes about like 50 miles an hour and it's, you know, you, you barely feel like you're moving if there's a strong wind, but it's a lot, of, it's a lot of fun just to fly a plane like that. Awesome. Awesome. Hey guys. Uh, I want to tell it like it is. And I had some misinformation last week, and I want to correct that. The whole question came up with, when does the clock start when you get your PPP money? And it literally starts the day that you get your PPP money. Yeah. And from an accounting perspective, it's all about cash. So like in our case, in, in one of our branches, we got our money last Wednesday. So for payroll purposes, the first payroll is two days after that. It doesn't matter that the, the the monies in that payroll were for work that was done prior to the period. It has nothing to do with that. It's purely when those checks were written. So here's part of the bad news for, for us in that particular situation. We got the money Wednesday, so we don't even know that we, and we, we didn't really get a heads up. Our bank just slammed it in there. So two days later, that's our first payroll. And that's going to be a small payroll because we didn't even know the week before that we were supposed to be hiring more people. We started bringing more people on, but they're not really starting until this week. And the people this week aren't getting paid till next week. So out of our eight pay periods, we've just lost two of them, essentially. Bad news for us, but something that you guys need to be thinking about. And I guess the real thing is, and we didn't do this in this case, talk to your bank who's handling your PPP funds and say, when you when we get approved, I want to talk to you about when to release those funds. And, you know, you want to buy yourself some time before you actually get your money to get some things in place and get your people back to get maximum value out of that. And so that, that question came up. I had a couple of people hit me up on Facebook, and I don't know if I've answered, I haven't answered that on Facebook. I just got the real answer to that. You know, oftentimes we give the answer, you really need to talk to your CPA about that. Well, that's what we did today. And that was what he explained. And it's like, no accrual, it's just all cash. So, I you're, you're so on the clock. Um, and it, you know, for me though, the risk of bringing people back before that money was real was, was too much for me to, to make that call. So my first payroll um, last week was only for $3,000. And I didn't even draw it off the PPP the PPP funds because it was too late to um, it was too late to actually uh, attach my um, my payroll account 
to um, to my bank and for them to verify the bank accounts. I didn't have paper checks yet, so it was just a matter of you know what we're just going to deal with it this week. And um, the way that I'm potentially going to address that is is for staff that are out cleaning and producing revenue. I'm going to have two payrolls the final week, one with their bonus for working these weeks. Uh, which will be almost a thirty thousand dollar bonus spread out among all my employees, and so it'll be it'll be a payroll for us. Uh, an average payroll is about thirty thousand a week, um, give or take uh, twenty eight thousand, something like that. Um, so so we're going to catch that up with a second payroll in the final week with the bonus money that we're paying people for the differential um, that that they're going to get um, when this is all said and done. Uh, the other, the other thing is, um, you know, that it just, it, it just seems too risky to me to just like bring people on until that money's real and it's in your account. I mean, just be aware of that, that the clock starts and, and, you know, if you have, if you have other funds that you could pay them regardless, um, I just, I just was tired of paying full payrolls without, without work coming in. So that was a too big a risk for my size company to, to keep that going without, uh, but we did bring everyone back last week. We just did training. Uh, we have everyone on work share in Missouri for that for that week, where we're paying everybody to be um, uh, laid off twenty percent. So they're still getting that six hundred dollars federal uh, unemployment at least for a short period longer. Um, and uh, we're working this week. So today we did our first day of revenue, and um, normal day is between eighty five hundred and ninety five hundred. We're at like 9,300, so we're at like 33%. Uh, I was a little higher later in the week. Um, right now, we're projecting about 18,000 for the week, and the normal week is somewhere around 40, so not quite not quite 50%, so down, down probably about, you know, down probably over 50%, down to about 55% so far. But with some other cancellations, we're projecting about 40% uh, for the first week back. And everyone's still on WorkShare this week. Um, but WorkShare, the one thing about that program where our employees are temporarily, you know, partially laid off is that the second you have to hire a single person in the state of Missouri, WorkShare is over. And um, with we're, we have about five people that are going on uh, FFCRA. And I want to talk about that a little bit, uh, too, if you guys could sideline into FFCRA a little bit about how that affects PPP and things like that. Um, but, uh, that, that program is, is a good program. I think it's going to really help a lot of our people. And I want to talk about that a little bit, but, but anyway, so by May 11th, I think we're going to need to have most everyone back that can come back, um, based on projections of, you know, increasing revenue week over week. Um, you know, when we include those people that are going to need to be on long-term leave for, for childcare. Um, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Are you, are you thinking your staffing levels are, are, are going to continue to increase or where, where do you see uh, this? Yeah, we, we do. We are uh, starting to uh, reach out to clients. We actually started working on that uh, last week and, you know, we're, I don't even know what the exact numbers are. I've been, been focusing on, on a lot of other things right now, but uh, I know that we've got several teams that, that, that went out today and this is on the residential side. We've still been doing, some of our what we call resumercial work through the through the duration of this but uh you know early returns we're encouraged by the response that we're getting from our recurring clients at the same time though we're looking at this it's like okay well you know we're we're, we're working towards getting back to 50 percent but that's going to be the easy 50 percent the last 50 percent is probably going to be a whole lot harder to get yeah yeah, I'm out. I'm out bidding. We actually just landed a four thousand dollar a month um, apartment commons uh, contract. Uh, we we sign on that uh, tomorrow. So I'm, you know, I'm putting people to work. My my office staff. Uh, I gave them a list of about six hundred apartment complexes. I used a data company to kind of filter out um, property managers, apartment complexes, and I will tell you that is brutal work. I felt really bad for them to do that. Um, but man, they sounded like pros by the end. They just were used to getting those rejections and they were taking those rejections with stride and really hitting them back with, you know, some good, some good, you know, you know, feedback on like, well, you know, let us just, 
let us just put you in our email and we'll just we'll follow up with you because you never know when you never know when things change and and they collected a pretty good amount of emails they they did about 158 calls last week and i think they collected 38 emails and uh, we put them into made central for some follow-up and um i don't know i thought i thought 38 38 emails was pretty good you know nothing else and you know um we got uh, one more quote out of that, and so I'll quote that I think this week. And um, if we get it, we get it. If not, you know, it's still, it's we're still going to be in Made Central, and we're going to put, we're going to just keep adding um, these commercial properties to call and to go after. Um, and so we'll get a reminder every month to give them a call. <laughs> you know, we just we had to remember to space those out. We were creating uh, reminders in Made Central to to say, hey, call them on this date in 30 days. And I had to tell them, like, hey, set this one to 35, set this one to 40, because like, you don't want these all to stack up on you again, like, 30 days out, because it's going to be awful if they all kind of hit at the same time. So we, uh, For that yeah. residential work, in my experience, that's the way to do it. Yeah. A lot of times, it's just being at the right place at the right time. And, you know, as long as you're part of the thought process, when the need pops up, when they get disappointed in their current vendor or something changes, I mean, you're, you're there. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think, um, I think you know, everyone gets discouraged with those kind of calls, but it's not about the first call. It's, it might be, it might be the 15th call. I remember the guy that sells us our cars for our business. Um, his nickname is Bones. He's, he used to be a catcher for the Cardinals and he sells cars. Now he was like the bullpen catcher and a uh, really nice guy, but man, is he a good salesman because he has good follow-up. And so he must have called me like 30 times over the course of a year trying to get our business to, to lease Toyotas because he saw us on some list of companies that was that had a bunch of leases through Toyota. Um, and so he wanted our business. And so he called me and he's just like, hey, just come in. I just want to, I want to show you what I can do for you. And eventually I was just fine, fine. I'll come in. Let's, let's talk about it. So he wore me down by just like, you know, just calling and he was never pushy or anything. He's just like, you know what? Hey, when you're ready to talk and have you know have a need for a car, just give me a shot. Just give me a shot. And it was like finally, I was like, all right, let's 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 put a deal together. And he made it so easy for me that he made it impossible for me to say no when it was time to sign sign on the paperwork. He's like, he already had the credit all already. He had it all done in our business name. Like he asked he asked me for exactly what he needed. And you know that's part of being a good salesperson is making them not have to work for it. Uh, you know, make, making your 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 prospect, you know, letting them know exactly what you need, and um, yeah, it was it was a good it was a good example of like tenacious sales, but but not being pushy. But, but like you said, being in the right place at the right time. He caught he finally caught me when I was like I needed a car, and um, yeah, I mean, he must have called yeah. a few times. You know, one of the things that we did over here was because we're reaching out to everybody that we could come could think of too. Also, if we haven't talked about this before, you guys, check out referenceusa.com. Mm -hmm. You can get your list there really, really easily. Yeah, I forget. Uh, okay. I forget who I, I we got a trial and you could get like 150 free contacts. I'll try and I'll try and send that that right. company that gave us the, the free trial and then you can at least see and if you're in a smaller market, there might only be 150 apartment complexes. Um, what I was talking about before, though, was FFCRA. Um, are any of your Wait, let me, let me finish real quick, Matt. Oh, so what I was going to say is one of the things we did is we had a contest, you guys. And whoever got 50 no's first won the contest. So a lot of times, uh, you know, everybody's focused on, on getting those yeses. But getting everybody focused on trying to get the no's, getting there first, was actually really helpful. Um, because then people stopped seeing those no's as a bad thing. It's like, yes, one more, one more no, one more no was good. Of course, we wanted the yeses to go around with them, right? You got a bigger prize for the yeses, but secondary prize was for getting to those, that 50 no's. Somebody so, says yes, it's like, are you sure? You know, Please. I mean, <laughs> yeah, the, the bigger prize was for was for the yes, obviously. We're, we're, so, we're also used to inbound calls where people want us. Like we, you know, people don't really realize the difference between inside sales and outside sales. And, you know, we're basically doing inside sales. Like sales are coming in. We already have leads already pre-qualified. That's a whole different sales than the kind of person that goes out and hunts for, for leads. Um, that's a different kind of salesperson. And uh, that's a that's a whole different ballgame. I will say there's a, 
there's a different person that can that can handle that day in and day out. But I think if you make it a game like you were talking about, Liz, that's a that's a way to turn it into a positive because it can be it can be really hard. Yeah, and people don't mind nearly as much. They just they're they're so focused on tallying them and and trying to get to fifty that it's it's really not a bad thing at all. So. Nice. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point that out real quick. Uh, I wanted to say one more thing about something you said earlier, Matt, was, um, and Tom also was talking about this, bringing your people back. So you don't, um, like, I don't have my PPP money, and I'm like, I think it's Wesley that's like, um, or maybe it's Bridget, I can't remember who it was, uh, a regular on the, on the calls was saying, I'm so optimistic I'm getting the money, don't know if I am or not. I, I'm in the same boat, I, I'm expecting to get it, I'm B of A, I'm a big bank, um, I can't imagine why I wouldn't get it. So what I've done is, uh, of course, I've primed all my people so that they know Make sure your uniforms are clean, you guys. I'm going to be giving you like 24 hours notice. First person here is going to be getting a prize, of course. I'm a big on, on giving some kind of a prize. And just so you know, you guys, my prizes are lame. So freaking lame. But people still love winning prizes. Like a can um, but, of beans. Uh, no, Tom, not a can of beans. Can of beans, you have to work hard to win a can of beans around this company. Uh, usually it's like a candy bar or, you know, something lame. I mean, really. Um, but... Uh, what I was going to say is we do have some people that are that have already talked to that are ready to go so that, that can start working, get on payroll on day one. As soon as that PPP money lands my account, my web, my web designer is on payroll and he knows he'll be on payroll for and we've already talked about terms, what he's going to be doing. We've got his job set out and he'll be on payroll for at least six weeks, hopefully eight. Right. Depending on how it works. But. You don't you don't have to put them on today, but make sure that they're ready, that they're they want to come on, too, because they're going to be making money with you. So yep. that's just another another tip there. Yeah. Sorry, Carol. And then, yeah, thanks for America. And then you have employees that just can't come back. And that's where the FF, the FFCRA is. So the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act. Right. And that's yeah. something we were all really scared about at first because we're like, well, how are we going to pay for this? Right. This um, and a couple there's a couple of ins and outs. That uh -oh. oh no, lost Matt. It gives you two weeks of paid time back. if you uh, get coronavirus or or have uh, an illness um, related to coronavirus or have to carry care for an immediate family member. It's like two weeks. I don't remember all the details, but it's up to ten weeks for a child care provision. Twelve. Twelve, Matt. Or Twelve weeks. Okay, I thought it was ten. Twelve but weeks. Okay. Twelve weeks. Now you have to pay for that. You have to pay for it up front. Um, but it comes back in the form of a tax credit within the next quarter, um, I believe. And I, and I don't have all the details of it, but your payroll company should have a pay tab that if you have to put someone on that, like Gusto makes it really easy. Um, I just switched to Gusto. I really like this feature where it's just like, uh, there's like a tab that says family first corner relief act, uh, you know, like payroll. And you, you can run that as a separate payroll. Who needs to get on that? And um, that's a that's a pretty great feature that w is within a lot of payrolls. A lot of the big payroll companies are being really proactive and getting this out there. Uh, something to consider, though, is that that let's say they're on that that uh, twelve week program Liz mentioned. They only get two thirds of their of their pay previously is covered by that in, in form of a tax credit. Now you could pay them more; you wouldn't get that back as a tax credit. But um, two thirds of their wages would be covered as a uh, as a tax credit for that period. Now, any money that is a tax credit is not deductible against your PPP funds, whereas this is where, it's get, where it gets complicated because I have I can only have one bank attached to my uh, payroll at the same time. So my it's going to draw off my PPP funds. I, I just need to know that they're marked correctly, and I know Gusto is doing this, so that at the end of the day, I'm not trying to uh, get one over on my bank and say, hey, I'm deduct, I'm, you know, deduct that from my PPP funds. Uh, you know, uh, allowance, you know, at the end when you, when you forgive my money, um, no, that's going to be unforgiven, but, uh, I'm going to get that money back in another, in another way via, via a tax credit. So just remember that you're not going to, you can't double dip, um, on, on any of these programs. They, they definitely, you know, I thought there was going to be like, Oh, I'm going to put these people on FFCRA and I'm going to get to deduct them. No, you don't get to, you don't get to do that. So, so from a money standpoint, you can't double dip, but they're they count towards your headcount, don't they? 
They do. They do count towards your headcount, from what I understand, because they're still they're still. That's awesome. Yeah, so they're still employed by your company. They're they're still employees. Um, you know, so they're 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 counting towards your headcount. Um, they don't count towards a reduction in wages because that's they're still getting 100% of what they're allowed by law. So they don't, from what I understand is they're not going to count against your, um, your reduction in wages. So, I mean, the way that it's written is the way that it's written. And I would, I would just uh, look at those and again, see if your payroll processor has made it easy for you to track those. And uh, that's something I'm like, I'm actually really happy about that. Cause there's, there are a lot of my employees that are like in a pretty tough spot with childcare and, um, I can tell you a lot of them want to come back. Like I know a couple of them that are like, Oh my God, if I could just get out of this house right now, I, I'd be thrilled. Yeah. We actually got some letters uh, to them. So we had a couple that were just ready. Like they're like, I got to get out of this house. And they like, they got childcare last week uh, with the letters we got them. Um, so um, that was good. We were actually able to get uh, several people back uh, that wanted to come back with um, uh, essential, essential employee letters. Um, we were, we were deemed essential if we were serving essential employees. So our return to service plan until May 4th is that we're doing essential businesses and we're doing employees that are deemed essential. So that that's probably why our total revenues may be a little bit lower than maybe some other companies that are still sure. serving all of their, all of their customers. And everything you said for the uh, paid FMLA also uh, applies to the paid sick leave, I believe. Yeah. In terms of, you can't double dip on the dollars, but it still counts towards your head count. Yeah. And I don't have all the details as much on that one. Um, I'd have to look at them all again, but you're right. It's that you cannot double dip. Um, I know that it's again for if you get sick or if you've been exposed to someone who's sick. And I think it's even for if you have to care for someone else, but not a child. Like if you have another family member, a spouse, someone like that, um, that part I would look into because I'm not 100% sure. It's been a while since I, re since I read through all that. Um, but I'm actually really happy about this because it, it gives us the ability to, like, I remember we were all worried about this at first, like, who's going to pay for this? Well, the government's paying for it. You're paying for it up front, but they're, they're taking on the responsibility. And you know what? I mean, this isn't a bad model for how something like this could be done for giving more additional leave on other things. I don't want to get into that can of worms, but as an example of how a small business could afford to provide some more you know, benefits like a big business. This is a, a really good program. And I was like, why, why do businesses over 500 not have to participate? What I didn't get at first was, oh, it's because we get a tax credit back on this. And it's, it's a benefit to the small business and to our employees. But the, the, I think the part that's causing a lot of um, friction is a lot of smaller companies don't have that money to pay up front. They yeah. can't, oh, that's a quarter a quarter's worth of payroll for if they've got multiple people, you know, they might not be able to float a quarter's worth of payroll for five people. I mean, well, they're, they're the EIDL funds that the, the, the emergency part that we were supposed to get in three within three days of applying was that was in part what that was supposed to, to, to fight. Right. Yeah, that's right. Matter. I, I just got the idol too late for that, but hopefully, and a lot of times now what's happening is people got so far behind losing so much that they're using their idol just to pay some basic things that they've gotten behind on. So they're still feeling the pressure of, you know, the FFCRA and, and, yeah. and putting people on unemployment, et cetera. I got caught up on all my insurance premiums, even though that they told me I had till June to, to pay them. I was just like, that makes me nervous. That made me nervous when uh, like having insurance premiums not paid. Like there's stuff that I'm willing to not pay. They can have the cars. They can, you know, like that's, <laughs> you can take those. If that comes to it, if you don't want to work with me on the cars, but man, I don't know if I want to ever worry about getting my work, my workman's comp canceled. That's not something I really want to mess with. So as soon as I got that money, as soon as I got that money and I was like writing, well, digitally writing checks to, uh, to some of my, my, those were, you know, probably a third of that money was gone just in insurance within a day, basically. Um, but I, I felt better about doing it because there was a little more money in the bank. But I get it. Um, but they were late by the time I sent them. They were due on the fourth, and I think I sent them last week. So, and I'm never late on those. So that that was like a big, that was a big weight off my chest because I I hate the idea of losing my insurance. Like that scares me. Yeah, 
don't even want to take a chance that you know that they're saying well you didn't pay and you have this huge claim it's like Ugh, now it's just not the time right i know so it, it made, makes me nervous too yeah it made me nervous even though they told me i had until june to pay i was i just yeah. wasn't comfortable setting that out there for a couple more months and and not having that square um yeah that, that's yeah and, and you know one of the things that we can do if you're paying like on a, on a monthly basis based on projected payroll is to go back and say, Hey, my payroll has gone down for, for obvious reasons. Yeah. And you can probably, yeah. I mean, in a lot of cases you can get that premium reduced. Yeah, we did that. And I think that, uh, I think we've had that discussion before. So we lowered our projected from like 880 to 500 and I'm probably, I'm probably robbing Peter to pay Paul there because um, I lowered my, premium down to like 16,000 for the year. So I'm almost paid for the year. I've got like one more thousand dollar payment and then I'm done. Well, that's not, that's not realistic for our work comp. So at some point I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to, but I'm going to have to, you know, get that readjusted and looked at, but um, I could wait till the audit. If, you know, if I want to, I could wait till the audit and that gives me all the way until probably early next year to pay that. Or, or adjust it as we go throughout the year and just kind of ramp that back up. So but that's a great strategy. Uh, that'll help with your um, that'll help with your your business owner policy to some degree too. Although your business owner policy is not anywhere near as expensive as your work comp. So um, reducing that work comp big number and lowering that down um, can can really help with with an expense. So yeah. Yeah, they have a couple of questions here, you guys. Um, I, I like to get to if we can. Um, Cindy Fields asks, um, if you were closed April 1st, you're exempt from the CARES Act, aren't you? So I don't remember what the April 1st, do you guys remember that? There was an April 1st deadline, yep. but I thought it had something to do. Go ahead, Matt. I guess if you stay closed and you don't and you don't bring anyone. Yeah, yeah, if you're, if you're completely closed, and um, everyone was laid off prior to April 1st. And um, yeah, yeah, you would be exempt. They're on, they're on unemployment. Um, yeah, and if you don't, but as soon as you come back, it, it, you know, you, you would be subject to it, but you, would, you could get a waiver if you're under 50 employees yeah. and don't have the cash. Yeah. What, yeah, what, I mean, I don't, as a company, I don't know if you're exempt, but what that does mean is if any employee comes back that was laid off in the month of March or prior once paid sick leave or once any of these other benefits, then, you know, that's, that's off the table. Now, if somebody got laid off April 5th, you know, April 2nd, April 3rd, then I think there was some thinking that they could still swing back around and say, well, I want to do the uh, paid FMLA or the paid, paid six time. And you might have to, to honor that. Although they're better, they're probably getting more money on unemployment than they would if they were trying to get two thirds of their wages from you. So yeah. it's probably unlikely. Um, it's probably unlikely we're going to see any, you know, downfall to or any any downside to that until probably July. Uh, July twenty fifth is when this uh, this increased um, uh, federal unemployment. Uh, I don't know what you'd even call it. It's just, I don't know. Dollar a federal, <laughs> yeah, dividend. It's yeah, windfall profit. Yeah. yeah, I I do think you could have a little bit of um, um, you you might want to expect a little bit from any of your employees that had worked you know less than thirty days because for them they're definitely going to be uh, making out better with the FSCRA. Everybody else is. They don't qualify. Not, they don't. They don't qualify. Yeah. So they're. They, they don't. Mean, they don't I, I thought that they did qualify for FFCRA, even if it's less than 30 days. Uh, you'll have to look. I thought there was a waiting period of at least 30 days, but it could, okay. it could, it could be wrong. And I know there is on FMLA, but I thought that was part of the FFCRA is that there was not that. Eliminated the wait period. It's normally, it's normally, it's, it's, one, it's normally it's one year for FMLA it would be the typical, you have to be at the company for one year. I thought they reduced it to 30 days for this new policy. Okay. Um, but I, I haven't read it in probably like 60 days and I've read a lot of other stuff since then. <laughs> um, and I, I got the information from someone else, so I, I, I'm absolutely not swearing by it. I'm just saying what, what I've heard. Yeah. This is, 
you know, I'm just listening and thinking about this, and it's just insane the amount of new information that we've had to learn to keep up with here over the last month and a half. This is it's like a whole new set of rules. In addition to all the stuff that we, you know, needed to know and to keep up with prior to this. Yeah, no kidding. Okay, let's see. We got a couple more questions here. Trina says, I have two on unemployment that cannot come back since the schools are not open. She's waiting on her accountant to get back with her. Um, they need to come off unemployment and go on FSCRC, right? Well, I mean, if you if you call them back, this is going to be this this is going to be a part where like you're 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 putting yourself into a tough spot with your employees and and so i called everyone back and i got them all back because i put them all on on this 80 percent of pay like 80 percent of pay and they're still getting the federal money too for a little while but that's gonna have to end we're projecting may 11th so that's like that's like two more weeks and i think we're gonna start having to hire and that's going to end that gravy train for everybody based on a few people that we don't really think are going to come back and a few people that are going to go on the CARES Act. Um, but to your point, you um, might be better off hiring somebody else and letting her remain on unemployment because if you if you call her back and you put her on the CARES Act, you're, you're probably taking money out of her pocket um, and she's probably not going to hold a lot of loyalty to you when this is all over. I mean – I hate to say that. That's that's probably you know that's probably um, that's probably not a popular opinion. But Liz well, might have a way to get around that. But of I, course, I, I tell you, a less popular opinion. Oh, bring her back, and she's disgruntled and doesn't do her job well, and then you terminate her for cause, then gets nothing. I I'm not advocating that, yeah. but I mean that's kind of the logical, you know, progression. I know. I know. It's a tough, it's a tough, and here's the thing. And I've been having these conversations. I, I just did a video update and, and I'm doing video updates with my staff every, uh, I'm usually doing them on Sunday after the work week. I'm putting out, some, you know, sitting down and kind of, you know, compiling all the things that have happened this week so that they're aware of all like where the company's going and what we've, what we've changed, what we're doing differently all of a sudden. And, um, and we, I also spend the weekend building some new trainings out for them and we can talk about, some of the ways that I'm able to get that stuff out easier. We talked about shooting videos, but I also want to show, you know, PowerPoint, like how you can actually quickly put a video out via PowerPoint. If anybody's interested in, you know, creating some quick trainings just based on, on slideshows, like basically, and you can voice over those and create some quick trainings. But using like QuickTime on my Mac, I'll just do like a recording like this. I'll sit in this room or I'll go to my office where it's quiet on the weekend and um, catch up on some paperwork and um, hit record, put something out. Uh, and we, we're putting out that stuff. Uh, I lost my train of thought, but I know we're putting those out weekly. I don't remember where we were going when I, when we started on this, but, uh, yeah, it, it, sorry, well, lost it. That's okay. That's okay. Because we've got a couple questions here, Matt, that, um, we're speaking to what you were talking about. Um, yeah. Charlotte Mixon is talking about, she received her PPP. She had to lay off half of her work store, her, her workforce, but she has been open. And so she's asking, do I try and gradually bring these people back and put them on a salary because she doesn't have enough work to um, pay them what they were getting paid before? So, yeah. Well, you have all the money. I mean, you have all the money to pay them what, what they got paid before. You're not under any obligation to pay them any less. The government wants you to be a pass-through entity for unemployment instead of, I mean, here's what they want. And this is, again, opinion, not necessarily like what's written in the law. But the, my opinion is, the government is trying to make the unemployment numbers look less painful than they are. So this PPP program was a, a, a brainchild of, well, the economy is stronger if there's not 20% unemployment. So let's give businesses money to bring their people back and pay them to work. And they want you to pay them to work. They, their, their biggest concern is that you bring them back to full employment and pay them regardless of, of whether you have enough work or not. So my suggestion is either find something for them to do or give them additional training to make them better human beings. Um, we started a Google classroom with, we're having them even watch Robin Sharma videos. And, uh, and uh, I really like Robin Sharma, Go, like get on YouTube and watch some of his videos on leadership and things like that. We're having them do a lot of that kind of stuff um, with, with the, with the time that they're not cleaning. We have them on, 
on a work share program, which means that they're only getting four days a week. They're getting 80% of their uh, prior pay. Uh, they get 20% of their eligibility for unemployment and 100% of their federal unemployment money uh, temporarily. So most of them are actually making more money to work less for a, temp for a period of time. Now that doesn't apply to every state, but I know it applies for about 30 states. So you might wanna check and see if your state has a work share program. It's a little extra work. I'm not in love with it as far as it, all the extra paperwork that I have to do where I'm going into my office on Sunday and you know figuring out all this extra paperwork, but it got everyone back on for our head count. So our head count looks good for three weeks now until we have to hire again. And um, we're just paying them to train this first week, or actually today they're actually cleaning and I still have six more people uh, that uh, I need to get on FFCRA after this week and then six more that have returned to service plans somewhere between uh, now and June 1st. If anybody's not back by June 1st, um, we're, we're not paying them, but we are paying a bonus at the end of this period uh, for everyone that was working every single day, I'm paying an additional $80 a week for seven weeks that's gonna be paid as this additional payroll. Okay, that's like, I think it's, do the math for me real quick. And those, and those are for the people, and those are for the people who aren't doing the job share. Those are your full-time people. Right, those are, well, no, everyone, everyone's on job share right now. Everyone, any, but anyone that's out there producing revenue right now, because there's some people that just wanna, I need a few more weeks or my kids or whatever, but mm -hmm. everyone producing revenue is getting an extra $80 per week bonus and an additional two hours of PTO um, in their bank. So they're actually getting bonus, you know, the two hours of PTO is from me, but that's not available till after July, after July 1st. I can't use, I can't use PPP money for that because it's not in the accrual period. That's just, all right, their PP, their, their PTO banks have been wiped out. Nobody has vacation days. I, and I also want them to have, you know, another little reward. I didn't want it to all be cash. Um, you know, I wanted it, you know, I, I PTO is a big deal at our company as, as something we give out as a reward. So um, we did that. So equivalent, um, equivalent of, of over uh, $100 extra, more than that, really, like um, about, a, about a, basically about $100 extra per week in bonuses uh, for seven weeks between these two things. Um, but, but a big chunk of that will be a cash extra check in the final week for those cleaning. Um, and, and, that, and again, you can pay your people more than what you were paying them before. The question is, I don't want to pay them for, you know, this, this, and this. The truth is you may need to pay them more than what you were paying them before to make it worth it for them to work in this environment. Um, where, uh, I hate to say it, some of them could potentially be making more in unemployment and not want to come back. And I know we don't really want employees like that. Potential. That's pretty much a solid. Yeah, I'm like, what, what are you talking about, Matt? Every single one of them. <laughs> Yeah. It's not a maybe thing. It's a it's a factual thing. They are making more on unemployment than when they worked for you. In if Missouri, they got unemployment, they're making less. Yeah, and in in Missouri, it would be uh, about a twenty three dollar equivalent. And we pay and we pay well at my company. The average average technician is making about seventeen dollars an hour. Um, you know, I know that's it sounds high to some of you, but there's we're a commission based company, and and we have a, a culture of of sharing in you know. In, in how we and how we you know do things and we're still very profitable even even at that period but damn near damn near twenty three dollars an hour I can't make the math yeah. I mean the federal money is sixteen dollars an hour at forty I mean fifteen dollars an hour at forty hours a week on top of well by itself state. yeah and so if you're already paying seventeen that's what thirty three thirty two seven and five twelve twenty bucks an hour twenty basically I have to pay six dollars more per hour. I'm not willing to do quite that much, but they're in bonuses. They're able to make almost another four dollars an hour with, with what we're going to pay out in the final, um, in the final, um, not quite that much, three dollars an hour, but in the final uh, um, weeks of this. And I, I'm kind of holding it towards the end to see who makes it, who does what they're supposed to do. Yeah. I have some, I have some other caveats in it, but um, I don't know if that's you know. Part of me is like, is that morally right? Are we like, are we actually just setting ourselves up for some real problems with like work expectations down the road? There's a lot of holes in this PPP that actually are making us do some irrational things that we would. Sure. From an economic yeah. standpoint, this is this is crazy. A lot of what yeah. we're doing. You you made the uh, 
the conjecture and and you know I've, I've thought the same thing that part of the incentive for PPP is just to make the unemployment numbers not look as horrible as they they, they do anyway yeah. but I heard somebody from the administration explain some of the rationale behind it and it kind of makes sense that yeah. part of the thinking is they want to keep your empl employees engaged with your company so when you start to get busy again it's going to be easier to run. whereas if they're completely unemployed and disengaged with your company, you're going to, in some cases, have a hard time just finding them and getting them to come back. And I know that, that you know, we've been working hard with communication plans and keeping, you know, keeping up with people even when they've been furloughed. But for a lot of companies, it's like cat herding, just trying to find their people and getting them back. So if they can keep on the payroll on the government's dime, theoretically, it's going to be easier for them to start back up because they've got their employees already there still working for them. Yeah. All right. So short answer, Charlotte. Yes, bring them back. Yes, pay them more money. You have a lot more money if you got your PPP, right? You have two and a half times payroll. I know it's an old payroll and, and now your payroll is probably bigger, but you still have a good chunk of money to be able to pay them more. Run your numbers, pay them more. You don't have to pay them for necessarily cleaning. Matt was talking about training. We've talked sure. before about having them help you with marketing. We got a lot more questions here that I want to hit. So that's just your quick answer there. Linda has a question. Okay. Go ahead, Matt. I can show my screen while we're talking too, while you're kind of answering these questions. And I'll just, sure. uh, let me just show you um, a really quick thing while, while you're kind of talking through. And okay. Well, while you're pulling that up, here's another question, Tom. Linda wants to know, does workers comp, is it covered by the PPP for the forgivable portion? What do you think? No. You're not in your no. head. If you, is that a hard no? I mean, it's, it, I mean, I don't, I don't see it anywhere specified that any insurances, even though you might be paying as you go with your payroll company, I, I would, I would say I'm a hard no on that. It does not specify it. I heard people trying to make the argument that they were going to put their leases of cars on there because it said leases. I mean, I, I don't know, man. I would just be, I would be really cautious. I think it's payroll and payroll expenses. I don't think work, month, work comp is a payroll expense, but you could argue that. A lot of people would say that it is because. I would think that it was. So I, I, for this one, I would absolutely tell you, check with your um, accountant and, Give and, it and how Again, you put it in there and you write the check of it off this PPP funds. It doesn't get forgiven. Well, you were going to write it anyway. You were going to pay that anyway. So, to pay it. so your operating yeah. account has more money in it right now because you didn't have to spend that money. So that's one that, okay, so that's maybe a gray area. I don't, I, I'm going to, I think it's no, but go, go for it. I mean, you know, work comp is definitely related. It's, it's a cost of goods sold for sure. It definitely is related directly to payroll. Um, it, oh, it, hey, we got a new question here that I've never heard before. Uh, this is from Bridget. She says she's got her PPP, but in the application, she had to sign saying that all her employees live in her state. Do, do you do, do uh, Tom, Matt, do you guys think that she can hire someone out of state and it will be forgiven? I didn't have that on mine and I hired two people out of state, but I, but they're paying, they're paying payroll taxes in Missouri. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I have I have two people that are out of and I have a bunch of people in Illinois that live in Illinois because we're right on the border. Um, yeah, I don't know about that. I never I, that wasn't in my application. That's that's maybe something with your bank. Um, and if it's if it's in the if it's in the paperwork, I would probably follow that. OK, so let's clear up a couple of things really, real quick here. We're going to we're going to dig on that a little bit because that'd that, be great, Tom. If you could, that would be really, really helpful to know. Uh, we do have some questions here. So um, hey, Liz, before we yeah. go, get back to the question that was asked yeah. earlier about the insurance, I'm going back to some information my CPA gave me earlier today. So this doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that this is this is their interpretation. So they got this out of, of one of the regs. This is what is defined as uh, payroll costs. And... Um, I posted it in the chat. Great. Hey, awesome. Rosemary, Rosemary said the same thing, that her accountant said it was okay to pay workman's comp off her PPP. Well, maybe I'll raise 
maybe I'll raise my uh, my uh, um, back up to eight hundred and eighty thousand and and get the bigger bill and just write it as one big check and see what happens. I mean, I'm going to pay it one way or another. So right, what's the worst that can happen? Don't forget it. Nobody could could claim that you were trying to commit fraud by doing that. No, not at all. Uh, so we got a question here about bonusing. Um, Denise is saying, yes, bonuses sounds great um, for the end of the uh, period for people that are working. But Marcia says um, that according to, and I'm not sure what SBAM is, Small Business Association, I don't know. Um, they say that you can't um, a bonus. Now, here's the thing with the bonusing at the end. Um, what I have heard is you got to be careful of that term. It's kind of like um, with the idle, they changed it from a grant to an advance. That word makes a big difference. So I think you might not be able to bonus people, but you may be able. To, go ahead, Matt. The bonus. The rules on the bonus were about uh, were about salaried employees and over a certain amount of pay. Um, it has nothing to do with hourly. Okay. Get clarity, but yeah. my interpretation from what I've read, and it's again, it's been a minute since I read all this, maybe last week, um, since I really dug in. And again, the rules are not finalized. There's no, there's no, out, there's nowhere out there where you can read the final rules. There was a, there was a draft of rules at one point on the SBA, and they took all that down. Uh, but the bonusing, uh, as far as being available as a pay, there was some steep restrictions on on bonuses and any kind of stock advances or any kind of, um, you know, any kind of uh, pay for executives or, or, or highly compensated employees over a certain point, over a certain pay, and that bonuses would count towards uh, the, the $100,000 per employee cap, but not that you couldn't bonus lower level employees. Um, and that would be, that would be counterintuitive to the way that the law is written because we're going to have to provide some differential in pay anyway um, for for getting people to come back to work in this environment. Even Walmart is paying people, I mean, not much, like $150 different, like $150, like it's very small, very small, but it's... Also, sorry, Matt, I wanted to clarify here. Leslie, you're saying, honestly, it's just $10,000, thinking it might not be worth this hassle. Um, we're talking about the PPP, that is the payroll protection program, and that's two and a half percent, two and a half times your average payroll for eight weeks. So it's a lot more than ten thousand dollars, Leslie. I think you, I think you might have the um, confused with the idle advance. Um, and the EIDL, the, that that amount of money isn't a small amount of money either. I mean, no. I know companies that are getting. Um, they're getting up to five hundred thousand dollars. I haven't heard anything bigger than that, and I have some friends with some very large companies, and um, you know, not even in this industry, other other things that are you know very large. And the uh, the the biggest I've seen anybody get is five hundred thousand for that EIDL, and that that is because they're probably just trying to spread the money around. Um, normally, it's kind of capped up at two million dollars for that program, um, but anyway. That that's a whole nother that's a whole nother ball game. It's less restrictive than it's less restrictive than the PPP. Doesn't have all the timelines. Of this. And for some of you, if you have that money coming, it might be another game you could play because there's some other tax credits and things like that. That would probably be a whole other call though. We would have to get into to try and differentiate the two and um, and what are the what are the strategies on tax credits versus PPP? Yeah. How are you gonna make those work? Yeah. And again, your accountant is going to earn his or her money over the course of the next few months here. Uh, yeah. their PPP. I bet they did. I bet they, I bet they got their PPP and, and uh, they, you know, uh, I bet they, not that they're loving it. Um, so Leslie is saying what I was going to say about the bonus. So um, don't worry about that bonus. A lot of times the word matters. Instead, hazard pay. Hazard pay, there is nothing against hazard pay. So you give them that all at the end. So that's great. Leslie, love that. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, new, new, new column in your payroll, hazard pay. I'm doing it. Yeah, today. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions here too. Tom, Matt, have either one of you guys uh, talked about how do our 941s play in here? Um, are they, what, what can you tell me about our 941s? Your 941s, your quarterly, your quarterly reports. 
Yeah, your quarterly yeah, taxes. Quarterly tax reports. Your federal, yeah. I, I, I would say they need to match what your payroll reporting would would be. I would, I would think that that's probably one of the sources they're going to go to for um, proving that you spent the money properly. Um, what I don't I mean, mean that, but I mean, will they be forgiven? What will they be forgiven as a part of your? Oh, uh, yeah. oh your your quarterly contribution. Oh, the the, the yeah yeah. So, so well, that money no, because that money is. The 941s is that's that's uh that's that's, that's part of that's the employer contribution as well as the employees oh, contribution. Oh. So, so the then the employer then the employer contribution would be forgiven. So for your for your uh for your FUDA and, and FIC or whatever it is, but uh um I don't think I don't think that the portion that they pay obviously isn't gonna get isn't gonna get for, forgiven. No. So um, but that's why, that's why those were your federal taxes were not initially in the, um, your federal taxes were not initially in the, um, uh, the calculation. So there's, there may be a chance that they're not, if you, if you remember the calculation, no federal taxes were in that. So they may not be giving you that I to, know. as an option uh, for forgiveness. Joey's got a bunch of questions here. What number do I look at on my weekly payroll to de to determine what number is actually forgiven? Gross pay, net pay? Do, does she deduct her federal taxes? And then how do you keep a running total of what money you have available left in your PPP? So I'm going to hit that last one because it's an easy one. Um, what a lot of people are doing, Charlotte, is just creating an Excel spreadsheet. And they're just putting their how much money they have in their PPP and they're just deducting it out and they're watching that money go away. That's or, just one simple way. Or even easier, I mean, you don't even need an Excel spreadsheet, just create a new bank account with your bank and when you fund your PPP, don't intermerse that bank account with your general. So, I mean, a good operating practice is to have a couple of bank accounts anyway for different purposes. So, um, you know, but, but, a, but a really good practice here would be, I at least what I think is a good practice, and you can talk to your own CPA, your bank, is I created a new bank account for it, and um, all the expenses that I believe are legitimate expenses through the PPP are only gonna go through that account, and uh, so payroll for the next seven weeks now, and um, you know, my lease, my lease expenses uh, to my, to my uh, building, and uh, the various other expenses I have to go back through and look at what, I really don't have that many that are actually legitimate other than payroll, so I've got to um, I've got to really really find out if this work comp thing is a good option because if that works, um, then that gives me a little bit more that I can put through. Yeah. I mean, some banks are are actually suggesting, recommending to their clients that they open a special bank account just for their PPP funds. Yeah. It's not necessary. You can track it through QuickBooks, but you got to be diligent doing it. Yeah, and you could create new. You could create new. Um, you could create new um, and this is she, she does have does have a separate account, you guys. That's that's not what the question is about. So absolutely, get your separate account. But then to track it, it, a simple Excel spreadsheet, and you can track it really, really easily. Even 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 easier too, probably is within QuickBooks. You could create new um, new items in your list of accounts. So you could put payroll, PPP, or PPP eligible, and then just track those within QuickBooks against that too. So like all of, all of your payrolls that were PPP eligible during that period, um, you could tag them with that, uh, with that chart or that, that um, I don't know what that's called. Uh, that tag. That so if you are, if you're QuickBooks savvy, absolutely do everything in QuickBooks. It's gonna make it easier. I'm assuming that you're not, because you already have all the, all the questions and you already have an account. The reason why I'm saying, if you're not savvy in QuickBooks, oh, this is fancy. I like this, Tom. Yeah, this is nice. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I don't see workers' compensation insurance in this list. Doesn't necessarily mean that it might not be there, but there's a lot of other detail here that leads me to believe that maybe workers' comp is an issue. I also what? don't see the employer what? portion of you know, the social security and, 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 and those things included in this either. It's got state and local tax, but not the employer portion of the federal em employment. What are insurance premiums? Health insurance. Health insurance. Health insurance. Gotcha. 
That's why, I mean, I, I don't want to say it's a hard no. It's just not how I'm, it's not how I'm going to probably initially go about it, but I'll ask when it's time to do, when it, you know, I'll sit down my, with my bank account and my CPA and, and ask. I think it's a good question and it's worth trying because it is, I mean, it's a fairly sizable amount of money for, for me and it, it could be, uh, it could make a big difference uh, to what I could get forgiven. I mean, so for me, because we're going to be operating it on some level, um, just remember all of this is, all of this is, we're in a great industry because a lot of us are going to be opening up a lot sooner than um, a lot of other industries, or at least have some portion of our business open or, 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 or are not completely ever completely shut down. So if you're generating revenue, your operating account should potentially be able to grow um, more, you know, so at the end of this, you have, you have potentially um, a little higher balance in your operating account, maybe significantly higher, depending on how much you can get your business back up in these eight weeks. And, um, you know, and then you've basically been able, you'll be able to make some investments in your business when this is over or, or you know, maybe for the first time ever have enough in there for uh, a good safety net and don't spend it all because you have it in the bank now. Right. So, you know, depends on where you are in the life cycle of your business, but this could be, this potentially could be something that actually sets you up um, to be financially um, well prepared for another downturn if you don't spend that money because this may go on again. This may go on for a period of time where we have some ups and downs in um, in business over the next couple of years. I'm not completely convinced that we're going to see this be, um, you know, we reopen in 90 days or 60 days or 30 days, wherever you're living and, and things get back to a little bit to normal, but we see some ups and downs in business based on, um, you know, localized outbreaks and things like that. So it might be a good time just to set that money aside in case you have your own PPP fund in the future. It's not, you know, just to be prepared in case there's a, a little bit of a downturn and you don't have to lay everybody off again. And I wanted to remind everybody that the PPP is a benefit to you. If you get PPP monies, there is no way it can hurt you. They're not going to take more money from you. No matter what you do, you're not going to lose out because of the PPP. Now, you wanna be careful that you don't have people, pay, that you're not paying people to do absolutely nothing uh, above and beyond what your PPP monies are. That's the only way that it could potentially come back and bite you in the butt. But if you are, paying your people to do work in your company for your company and the PPP is going to cover it. Are they going to cover every single penny? Maybe not. Are they going to cover more than zero, which is what you were going to get before? Yes. More than zero. So it's not going to hurt you. So don't be so afraid of the PPP. Yeah, it's, it's a good thing. As long as you don't misuse it, as long as you use it for what it's intended, you're going to have more money in the bank in the end of the year than what you would yeah. if it, you didn't have it. And and one just one thing though is is for for a, there's a there's a donut hole of you where um, the PPP may not make any sense at all. Like if you are in some of these cities that are New York City, Philadelphia that are maybe are looking at some prolonged shutdowns before they let anybody reopen, it may not be it may not be the best program for you and, and getting the EIDL money would maybe be better, but however, the PPP is funding now and the EIDL is just such a question mark as to whether you're going to get that money. But I do know some people that are getting it. Um, I don't know any way to, to find out anything more about that. I've tried to call 50 times myself. I mean, um, I'm sure they have some list of like every time I've called and they're like, Oh, it's this guy again. Um, <laughs> when is, when is it going to be enough that we told him, no, we don't have an answer. Um, but Tom's in the same boat. He's done the same thing. I bet. Yeah, we were, we're wearing them out. Yeah. Um, where are we on time, Liz? Yeah, we're, we're ready. Sorry, Tom. I did. I know we're going to switch over here. Um, but first, before we do, Matt, you mentioned a little bit earlier about some video training, et cetera. And these things. I'll, anyway, we, I'll just go really, let me just, so it turned my screen on just for a Hang second. On. Seriously, oh, on. we're right at an hour. Can we do oh, yeah. this sometime later this week? Yeah, we can do that. And what I'd rather do, Matt, if at all possible, I'd rather bring you on later because I want to be able to give time to it. I think it's an awesome thing that you're doing here. If you have the time. Let's plan on another time this week, but I'll just, I'll give them this. 
if you are a Google Apps user, check out and see if Google Classroom is built in because you're going to need to provide your people additional training right now. And so maybe we'll talk about that when I come on next time in about you want, you want to give, you want to give us a, a date now so everybody can set their calendar because this is really, really good stuff, but yeah. it's only going to take us a half hour to get into it. So. You're right. You're right. You're right. Let me look at my calendar and see what I got going on. The rest All right. Well, while Matt, while you're doing that, Tom, I really want to be able to talk to everybody about the new training. Um, so I, I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about that. And I do have a question about the COVID training. Um, this question came to me that you had said in the um, one, one place in the training is listed neoprene gloves, and then um, that you and you had also said that nitrile gloves are not okay for cleaning. Can you clarify those two things? I said they're not okay for cleaning, or they are okay. Yeah. Not. Nitrile is, is, is just fine. They're like kind of like uh, latex gloves, but made of a, of a safer material. They're, they're, they're wonderful gloves. And, yeah. and vinyl is, is fine as well. You did talk yeah. about latex and why maybe latex is not the best option. Latex yeah. is, is because some people have allergies to it. but uh, It's about 10% of the population, though. So it's a big enough, or maybe it's not that high. It's, it's, it's a big enough group, though, that it, it becomes problematic. Not 10%, though. I've... I've had hundreds of employees over the years, and I've only had one person ever be allergic. So it can't be that. High. It must be. It must be a fraction of a percent. Vinyl but is. It can be a severe. It can be a very severe allergy, which is why I stay away from it, regardless of how many people there are. Just stay I've away got from it. Cases of them, if you really need gloves, though. So I, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Matt's got money. Uh, Matt, Matt can loan you money too. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Um, so we got clarity on the nitrile gloves, you guys. Yes, that's a big go for, um, I know that some people heard that it was said that those are no go, they're a go. And then what were you saying about the neoprene gloves, Tom? Um, yeah, they're fine too. They're typically the, um, you know, heavier duty for like, you know, uh, oven cleaning, stuff like that. Um, thick, you guys thick. I'm sorry? I was just saying behind your back that they're really thick. They're hard to work with. They're hard to work with. If you're going to be using those, it's a good idea to have your your, your vinyl gloves or your uh, you know your, your your nitrile gloves inside you know on your hand inside of, of that double glove it so to speak. Okay, Tom, tell us about the professional house cleaner program. Am I sure? I'm, sure? Love this. I'm so excited. You Am you sure? are. Okay. You are. You are. Okay, we have a program here that basically covers what a professional house cleaner, every professional house cleaner should know. And we talked last Friday, there's a lot of people cleaning homes and, and being paid for, but not all of them are necessarily professional. And what we've done here is taken the best information that we've been able to pull together for over the last 20 some odd years. And a lot of it uh, comes from previous materials we've done in the past, like no putting together you know, this manual for the HCT program. We've done other programs. We've done uh, programs. I mean, we, we could go on and on about the various programs we've done over the years. But the fact of the matter is we curated it all the way down into something that hopefully is kind of the best of the best and the tightest presentation that we can put together for cleaning professionals, for the people who are cleaning homes every day. As can I interrupt real quick, Tom? Can I interrupt real quick? Sure. Thank you. So for those of you that are familiar with this book, the Professional House Cleaning Technician's Manual, and you've heard of this program, the HCT program, if you look a little bit closer, you can see these are the authors of this book. Tom is one of the authors on this book. He's one of the drivers of this program initially. And so I just wanted to point out that the information that you're getting in this program, sorry, Tom, I know we didn't talk about this in advance. He hates okay. it. <laughs> yeah, he's saying it's okay, but when we get off this call, he's gonna be like, Liz, I hate it when you interrupt me like that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So I just wanted to point out though, that the information that you're going to be getting in this program is the real information just been being focused toward the professional house cleaner. So this is not like some kind of just dumbed down program, some kind of just teaching them kind of random stuff all over the place. It's the real thing. Sorry, Tom, go ahead. 
No, that, that, that's great. Uh, thank you. And, uh, you know, the, the program consists of seven classes. These are the seven classes. And we're, we're trying to pull this information together in a way that uh, it's definitely going to be informative. Uh, some of it's going to, going to be a little bit nerdy, but we, we want to make it, uh, you know, entertaining and, and um, something that, that people are going to want to want to participate in as well. So the, the seven sections, the first part, uh, the, the first class is going to be on, you know, the role of the house cleaning professional, you know, what is uh, professional house cleaning? And we're going to help, uh, you know, our cleaning professionals understand, you know, the difference between just cleaning a house versus uh, being a professional and, you know, why that's important. And, you know, we're on the first uh, line of defense and infection control. And, uh, you know, your job's a lot more important than uh, maybe what, society recognizes and maybe what you recognize. We're going to talk about hygienic cleaning and, and, and cleaning for health, which is really, really important, you know, in today's world with uh, COVID-19 out there. Safety is really important. And, you know, th we're going to be covering safety in a much broader context than what we did in the COVID-19 training. You know, you pay workers comp insurance, right? So, you know, all the different ways, if you've been in the business for a while, that uh, a cleaning professional can can get uh, hurt or injured on the job. So we're going to be talking about those things and the techniques that, that we need to be using to uh, minimize the chance of, uh, of having accidents and having losses. So your people are able to be at work on a regular basis. No one gets hurt and your insurance is uh, as is, is low as you can hope for it to be. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the, the chemistry and physics of cleaning. And we're going to do this in a way that you know, we think that, you know, everybody, you know, all, all your cleaning techs are going to be able to, to get it. We're, we're, we're not going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to break this down into the basic components. And we think it's really important. If you're a professional, you have to know more about than you got to know the why behind what it is that you're doing. If you remember, you know, last week or when we were, we're, we're talking about the, uh, the COVID-19 training, we you know, talked about, you know, I've got a disinfectant. It's really important to read the instructions and use it the way the instructions tell you to use it. Well, that's great. That tells you what to do, but it really doesn't tell you why it's telling you to do that. If you understand the why behind it, then you're not just doing a task. You really understand at a level where you can perform at a professional level. So we want uh, all cleaning test technicians cleaning to be, you know, professional and to have that level of knowledge. And that's really what makes you professional. I uh, wanna get into the contents and the surfaces and the actual stuff that you're cleaning in the home and specific things that you need to know in terms of what products go on what surfaces and what furnishings and, 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 and things in the home and how to reduce the chance of uh, causing any damage and to get the best outcomes for, 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 for high, high quality and, and happy customers. We want to talk about, you know, what uh, do you do? We want to talk about the procedures, methods, and productivity, the scope of work, all of that stuff. Because basically, we're kind of pulling it all together now. We kind of talked about the concept stuff of cleaning for health and, you know, how to do it safely and the science and the behind all of that. This is the stuff you're cleaning. This is how you clean it. Then we're going to talk about the tools and equipment. So those are the seven classes. And you complete all seven classes. You can take the exam and get your certificate for uh, the being a professional house cleaner under this particular program. I'm responding to Leslie right now. Um, she wants to know, is this different from the HCT? And I'm saying that, yes, it's different from the HCT. It has all the basics of the HCT program, but it's in a much more, um, um, I don't want to say conversational style, but it will be a little bit more conversational. It'll be much. It's geared, Go ahead, Matt. It's geared towards our techs. Me and Tom have been talking about this for a while. Is that the HCT is kind of over, even over some of our heads sometimes a little bit. So Tom and Janice and and you know really those two. But I mean they've asked me and Joe for some advice and and some of the stuff is I'm like I know a lot, but Tom knows this stuff like you know way better than I do. So he's been able to kind of make it towards like 
uh, just get it down to the level where like, I know a lot about a, a lot about a, a, a lot of different subjects, but I don't know this stuff as well. So he's made it more digestible and that our technicians could probably um, grasp it and breaking it down into shorter modules um, so that people's attention spans don't get uh, too, too stretched out, you know, from, from doing it as one big long class where you sit there for eight hours a day. If the people who are cleaning homes every day don't have this information, we really are missing the mark. When we put together the original, you know, ACT certification program, I don't know, probably close to 10 years ago, and when we wrote this book, the vision was, hey, we're doing this for cleaning technicians. By the time we were done, it was evident that, well, really, we did this for cleaning business owners. And the people that are cleaning the homes really aren't getting this information. It was too expensive. It was hard to, you know, it's a two-day class. You had to pay extra for the exam. You had to pay. Two-day you know, in person. Two-day in person. Class. Yeah, there was travel. There was travel. Yeah. And the accommodations wow. often involved. And the class was a bit heavy, too. I mean, it's a, it's a great class. It's a wonderful class. Don't get me wrong. But for a lot great of cleaning class. technicians, they would want something, you know, presented in a, in, a, in a more more basic way. So that's uh, that's that's our goal. And we want to make this available for the cleaning professionals, for the people that are, that are cleaning homes every day. So that's, you know, in a nutshell, what we, we think is, is is unique about this, that this is 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 being designed and presented in a way that that, that the people who are cleaning homes can, can access it. Um, I guess Friday, we were asking about how we're going to price it. Well, the entire program, the seven classes would be $99 if we're just doing one class. Uh, we'll have bulk discount pricing and we're doing this for the uh, COVID-19 training. If you're you're buying multiple seats, you can get up to 50% off of, of that pricing. If you want to take just a individual class out of the seven classes, we'll make that an option as well. And there'll be uh, you know $29 a piece. Once, all, once somebody completes all seven classes, then they can take the exam for the uh, certification. There's no extra charge for that. Um, uh, we're going to start this. We're going to start this next week, and um, not all seven classes are going to be av available next week. It's going to take us a little bit of time to roll these out. We might be rolling seven classes out one a week. Um, this is I'm pushing for one a week, you guys, so that everybody has a chance to digest everything. Tom's really of the mindset that, no, we should give them all seven at one time. I'm like, no, one a week, one a week, one a week. Let's let's just get started next week, get people to start running. So um, we got a couple of questions here. $99 a person. How many is considered bulk? Um, so um, bulk is it's going to be kind of on a um, sliding scale. Remember how it's up to 50% off? You know, when you buy gloves, if you buy 25 pairs, it costs this amount of money. When you buy 26 to 50 pairs, it, it's this amount of money. And 51, it's going to be like that. There will be a sliding scale. Tom will have the details for it tomorrow. He wanted to put it on today. I said, no, leave it till tomorrow. It's too confusing, all these crazy numbers. So there will be some bulk pricing, but yeah, $99 per person. Um, good. I'm glad you're looking forward to it, Rosemary. It's me too. It's uh, it's it's great information. I love the way it's boiled down and simplified, and it doesn't have all of the other, um, yeah, I'm not going to say that piece. I'm not going to say that. Um, look at me checking, checking, checking myself right there. Um, is all classes online pre-recorded or is this live? Tom, have you decided if you're going to, how you're going to do the live pre-recorded piece yet? No, we haven't. Oh. You know, ultimately, you know, most of it's going to be delivered through, uh, you know, our, our learning management system. Um, doesn't mean that we might not do some of it live. Um, I guess that's to be determined. We've got a, got a few days to, to 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 work out some of those kinks, and we're looking for feedback. Actually, we we've, we've got options in that regard. And first class is Wednesday, Tom. Is that correct? 
Well, if, if it was if it was going to be live, that would be it. If we wind up just just starting off, we'll probably do something live. It might not even be a full class, but we'll give you guys some overview of what we're doing. We'll have more live material here over the next several days that that'll go into more detail of of, of what it's about to give you a flavor for it. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Carol makes a really good point, Tom. Um, if possible, it would be nice to have more than one per week to take advantage of our PPP money. Okay. Well, there you you, go. You might be, yeah, yeah, you might be winning there with that idea. Maybe um, I shouldn't have pressed Tom to do one a week for seven we weeks. Have yeah. This is opposed to seven, and then you could have one class for each week of your PPP. Oh. Yeah. There's all kinds of education. Okay stuff out there though too so this is one this is one component of it that would probably be an hour per week of additional training for your people there's a lot of opportunities but this is this, so much. this is a great i mean this is a great opportunity to build our companies right now and to, to build the knowledge and the culture that we want so i'm i'm really excited um to to get through this first myself put some of my top management people through it and then drip it down uh from there to our key um for to our key supervisors and then really just keep dripping it down. My goal is that anybody that's been with my company more than 90 days has to have has to have this knowledge, right? So it needs to, you know, that's that's the goal eventually. So I'm I'm excited to be able to do this. I've always wanted to do it, and I've always been envious that it, like Joe Walsh brings uh, Bruce up to his company once a year and uh, does this training for everybody. I've always been super jealous about like, oh my God, his people know this stuff. Um, and so, yeah, now we all get the opportunity to have that kind of level of, of knowledge to still do our people. So, and I want to point out that um, a big a big piece of, of why this is happening right now, you guys, like, why are we coming out with this program right now? Because it's been in the works for a long time and COVID-19 just brought it forward. It's like, this is our opportunity, which we keep saying, you've heard us say this for years. We want to professionalize the industry. We are sick of having it be just so scattered to the winds in such a fractured industry. We want to professionalize this industry. And that has to start at least in part with the people who are doing the work, understanding what they're doing, why they're doing it, the importance of what they're doing, and people seeing value in this job. So that's why it's happening now, because this is our perfect, perfect opportunity. Can we, can we use the term unprecedented again? This is like a once in a At least once a call. Once in a lifetime opportunity for us as cleaning business owners to do something to significantly increase the value of our business and for the people that we serve and the people that work for you, basically all of your stakeholders. And if we continue to do what we've always done, then we're really going to miss a lot of that opportunity. So getting better material out there and, and really taking advantage of, of picking our game up, your, your clients in the, in, in the marketplace is looking for something more to make them feel comfortable and make them feel safe. So we got to be bringing more. And that's what's really behind a lot of this. And that's why we need to get this information to the professional cleaners, to the technicians, to the people that are doing this work, because they're the ones that ultimately are going to be creating that trust and creating that feeling of, of, of a higher level of safety for, for, for your clients. And the time is now, so we have to move fast. Yep. And you guys keep hearing me talk about um, psychological safety as well. When people understand what they're doing and they understand how to do it, how to be safe, et cetera, they feel safe. You don't have the problems that you're having where people don't wanna come to work, they're afraid that, you know, there, there's a reason why some companies aren't struggling in that way because the, their people know this stuff. They already have this information. They feel confident, they feel prepared, and they know how to move forward. So I, I'm not struggling as much with this problem because my people have this training. Your people need to have this training too. No reason for only some people to have it. And if, one more thing, I'm sorry, I know we're way over time, you guys, but one more thing real quick. Don't forget, in a year, your company needs to look different than it did in February. If it looks the same, it, it's a fail on your part. This is your 
prime opportunity to make your company the best company in your area. You know how few companies are even knowing about this training? How many people are on the call right now? 500, 600, something like that are going to see this. Do you know how few people are going to actually invest in their companies to do this training? Your company needs to be one. You can be the company in your area. Ah, sorry. Okay. Off no, my it, 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 sorry, real, Tom. Real quick, the COVID-19 training out there, what house cleaning uh, professionals need to know is, is, is still out as well. And you can go to moderncleaning.com. And this is right to the point. And this has unique material in it that you won't get in the professional house cleaner training because we're talking specifically about the COVID-19, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the SARS uh, CoV-2 virus and all of the specific things that your technicians are going to need to know to clean in the COVID-19 world. And Realistically, they're saying we're probably a year and a half out before they come up with a vaccine. And they come up with a vaccine, it's going to be a big deal as to how long it's going to take for them to even make enough vaccine to, uh, you know, give it to to um, a meaningful number of people, and then distributing it and actually administering it. That it's going to be realistically, it's going to be several years of ups and downs and peaks and 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 and, and flare ups of this virus. So people, you're you're we as a community are going to be you know, mindful and looking for, for, for safety and comfort from COVID-19 for several years, realistically, barring some miracle, which from a scientific perspective, we don't know where that would come. Tom, did you already show where to buy the course? And did you talk about what time on Wednesday? How, how will this be delivered on Wednesday? No, we didn't uh, show where to buy the course because we're not don't have a place to, to even sell it yet. But that's coming. <laughs> uh, can't buy it. So really, this is the proof that we are so much more focused on making sure that everybody gets the information <laughs> than getting money. We don't even know how we're going to get paid. <laughs> and, and, and truly, we're juggling a little bit because we still are running a few house cleaning companies and still trying to deal with all the finance side of all the SBA stuff. And we're doing this too, but it's... <laughs> You know, we're, we're not sleeping. Much. Make it happen. And Robin, absolutely. The training cost could be included in the PP and the PPP. Absolutely. Yep. Your, um, big, Amelia. Your, biggest, your biggest cost to the training is paying for the labor of taking it. And that would be, that would be covered. Amelia, you will get, um, uh, there will be a way to refer back to the training after you've taken it. It won't just be live. <laughs> Marsha, excuses, excuses. <laughs> I love that. Um, All right. Well, we're way over we're way time. Over. Uh, cleaning um, business I today. You guys. If you you want to do that, you can subscribe here, and we got our. Show me where the resources are. I sent somebody. I told somebody to go to resources. They couldn't find them. Right here, it's uh, coronavirus dash downloads. There's no there's no button on it. You got to attend these coronavirus. Uh, Dash all right, I, I got it. Hold it. On. I did in the chat. Byron. All right, that sounds good. It was one of the people in my in the one of my MMA groups today, so I'll get it. Thank you. Okay, guys, um, do we have anything else? It's Not my birthday time. I just wanted to point that out right now. It's three thirty-one. It my birthday. birthday. Time. It was. It's my birthday time. 331. Oh. Yes. My oh, birthday. I never. Oh, okay. I guess so. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's well. Hello. Yeah. I just got to point it out to everybody. All right. We will see you all tomorrow. And thank yeah. you so much, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. Something free on Wednesday. I'm free on Wednesday if you want to circle back with uh, with me. I got a call tomorrow at five, but I can do. Uh, can awesome. Do let's, let's, let's book that. So mark your calendars for Wednesday. Matt will come back and will show us. Some some techniques to put together training material using just a simple power narrated PowerPoint. Yeah, maybe a couple yeah. other books too. Yeah, we'll go through a few things. All right. Okay, guys. Right. Thanks so much. We'll ah, see you. Bye, bye, everybody.
Bye-bye.